our November schedule is also posted on our website. Um, scheduling update for next Wednesday. It is Veterans Day, so that is a um, state holiday. We will not be having a board meeting on that day. Um, we also, on the next, just to highlight, on the next Wednesday, November 18th, that's when we're going to be hearing the 2020 update to the 2018 to 2022 Health Information Exchange Strategic Plan. Um, on Wednesday, November 18th, that same day, we'll have a primary care advisory group from 5 to 7. We have a meeting TBD for Wednesday, November 25th. I believe that's the day before Thanksgiving. Um, but since probably most people won't be going anywhere this year, <laughs> we'll probably, um, we're going to keep that on the books and we'll see how the uh, schedule goes this month and see whether we need that or not. And that is all I have to report out today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of October 28th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of October 28th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that they passed unanimously. So um, it seems like today would never come. Uh, we tried to set up this meeting uh, about a month ago and uh, get feedback from the hospital budget process. But uh, first we were interrupted by a nationwide uh, problem with teams and then it was one thing after another. But we're here today and hopefully um, in our foggy memories we can have a good debrief of uh, this year's process and come up with some, you know, maybe some interesting proposals on how it can be made better. So really today's about a discussion of what went wrong, what went right, how can it be better in the future? And to tee it off, I'm gonna turn it over to Patrick Rooney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's good to see everyone again. And uh, yes, hopefully we can make it through this uh, this time. Um, <clears throat> how would you like me to proceed? Would you like me to run through our list and then board members can kind of pick out some of those items to discuss, or would you like me to go through it one by one and we can discuss one by one? Uh, why don't you try going through the whole list, but if it becomes apparent that that's not going to work, uh, any board member can just uh, pop in with a question. Fair enough. That sounds good. And I uh, apologize for any awkward sounds that come through. I, I am living and working in an active construction zone right now, so if there's any Awkward noises that come over the speakers, I that is me, and I apologize in advance. So, okay, let's kick this thing off here. So our list is a bit of a brain dump. Um, we made this following on the heels of the decisions by the board. Um, we were still actively involved in drafting the orders at the time. Um, but as we went through, we did try to find areas where we thought value had been added this year. Um, and uh, potentially where value could continue to be added throughout the process. So that was really our focus while we were um, kind of dumping this all out on paper. So I'll start from the top here. Um, we thought the board um, did an excellent job at adhering to the request this year to keep any follow-up questions of a technical or clarifying nature. Uh, that seemed to help keep the process moving forward. Uh, it really allowed us, the staff, to um, just continue to pound away at the, the work that was ahead of us without having to go back too many times to the well of knowledge that our, our hospitals and answering some follow-up questions. And, you know, we did that in a year in which we were actually requesting less information. So that gave us some hope that, uh, you know, if we can return to the more normal process in the, in the years ahead, that um, we can still adhere to that because we'll have more information, which should, you know, bring about even less questioning um, just by the nature of that. So, um, we thought the board did a great job of getting all of their questions asked and answered um, when they had the hospital representatives in front of them. So we really would like to continue that uh, in the future, that if there are technical or clarifying uh, matters to be answered, that we adhere to that. Um, <clears throat> next would be the um, the value added by the collaboration by the hospital finance team and legal on motion language. 
this seemed to be beneficial to uh, the board members uh, and kind of remove the burden from Robin's shoulders on um, for on the spot uh, motion language. Um, one area of improvement, we did have a couple of places where we probably need to ensure the completeness of the motion language. So um, still a work in progress. But we felt that uh, that really helped you all um, kind of frame your your thoughts uh, in a way that expedited the the motioning process. So we would continue to improve that um, and keep that going in the future on all matters, whether it be um, acknowledging the provider transfers and accounting adjustments and the overall um, motioning for um, rate and NPR growth. Um, <clears throat> the budget review process as part of deliberations, we kind of changed it up this year um, while we were waiting for some more clarity from AHS around um, some of the state funds that were to be handed out. And, and if you recall, what we did was we kind of went through all of these hospitals after the, the, um, the hospital presentations and we reviewed them. And then you, you all made decisions kind of in rapid succession after that. And that was, uh, that was beneficial to, um, <clears throat> that was beneficial to, it seemed everyone and that you got, you know, reminders, you can take a lot of information in a very short time with all of these hospitals. And we were able to compile that and review it um, one after the other with you all. And then when it came time to making decisions, you move very rapidly through it. So that that might that might be a benefit of uh, for the future, um, just having to do that out of necessity this year. So we would encourage that maybe we do that again. Um, it seemed Andrew, to work. We just yes. had a request on uh, whether or not we're supposed to be seeing a list or if it's available somewhere. Oh, I can, um, here, let me share. That would probably work best. And I think we could email it out, Patrick, to anyone who is interested in it as you share it. Yeah. I don't, so. Certainly. Great. Okay, let, let, me, let me know when you can see it. We can. Okay, good. <clears throat> um, all right, let's see. Budget review process. Okay, so I'm on bullet point number four. Um, another one that we thought maybe uh, deserves a little exploration in the in future guidance would be breaking down the components of a requested increase in change in charge. And I've been kind of thinking about this over the last month or so, <clears throat> which is the benefit to this meeting being uh, canceled the first time, um, is that, uh, you know, what does the board want to begin to look at what components of a rate they are willing to accept? We had some discussions specifically with the uh, uh, UVM Health Network hospitals this year. They broke out their, um, their rate request. And you know, do we want to accept a portion of that to be a contribution to their um, their bottom line or their margin? And do we want to um, agree upon uh, an inflationary factor, et cetera, et cetera? So if that would be something the board would be interested in, we as staff would be um, happy to begin to have those conversations with hospitals and obviously some board members to kind of break out what the hospital is building into their rate. Um, <clears throat> And then kind of a sub bullet to that would be um, better definition around um, commercial rates and these charge requests. We we continue to have um, health network hospitals putting forth uh, a commercial effective rate. And the other one is, is um, and the other th side historically has been uh, request to increase charges. And they're two different measurements. And maybe it's time to, you know, decide which one for 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 keeping um, keeping track of these types of things and um, better defining overall what the board is expecting. You know, we have uh, the UVM hospitals who use that commercial effective rate, which, from what we understand, is they go back to their commercial payers and um, negotiate a bit a better margin on that book of business. And then we had other hospitals who. Um, used it, but in the sense that, well, we're going to increase our, you know, we want to increase our charges by this, but effectively what we will end up with is something else. So those are two different approaches and we probably need to define that and decide how we want to move forward. So that we felt would be a value add to, to the process as well, if we can hammer that out. Um, <clears throat> another one was uh, the impact of public payers 
on the change in charge? And could this be built into the point we just made about breaking down the components? Do we want to have an other payers offset? Um, if if someone's you know requesting a five percent rate increase, um, but for not the increase in either Medicaid or Medicare rates, it might be five point five or six. Um, how do we want to see that moving forward? It seems that some of the critical access hospitals will will tell us that due to cost report settlements, you know, there's a there's an impact on their request for the coming year and so on. So just kind of building that out a little bit more as part of our process. Um, <clears throat> another one that kind of came to the surface this year would be the um, and maybe looking at it in the future be having hospitals disclose uh, materially supported. Um, dollar transfers to and from entities not within the hospital, um, including the dollar amount anticipated. The, the fact is um, we live in a post-Springfield world, and there were transfers going back and forth between the hospital and the FQHC, et cetera. And it would probably be um, prudent of the Green Mountain Care Board to at least inquire as to what those are anticipated on being. Um, so <clears throat> moving forward, um, working with the hospitals and stakeholders about what that looks like. Um, it does not mean that the board does not support that. It just means let's put a new set of eyes on, on some of the activity that's going on there uh, to ensure that these organizations are stable and sustainable and, and that these transfers are not injuring one entity to support another and so on. So maybe opening that up a little bit or unpacking it as we often say. Um, uh, more guidance on change in charge uh, and how we want to approach that. Maybe that's something that we can build out uh, in the future. And that kind of goes back to the components of the uh, rate request um, becoming a little more explicit around what the board expects for uh, change in charge. That way, both hospitals and the board uh, know what to expect. Um, another one we've been thinking about lately is, is taking a better look at fixed versus variable costs. Um, cost is always a, a big topic in the budget meetings, um, and maybe we need to start looking at, um, you know, where do these hospitals um, draw the line on fixed versus variable? Where do they have potentially room to um, reduce their expenses? But in, in all reality, it would probably help the board to see what their level of flexibility is. So if they have high fixed costs, does that is that determined by their designation, et cetera, and the services they have to carry? Just again, educating and getting more knowledge around um, some of the operating costs that these hospitals incur. And kind of a sub bullet to that too is maybe trying to get a better understanding and unpack some of the, we'll call them hidden or stealth costs that are being incurred by these hospitals. We heard from Mount Escutney, um, they dis they discussed the the borders situation there, and <clears throat> in the last month, as most people know, we've been um, engaging hospitals in sustainability plan meetings, and this topic has come up over and over and over again. And hospitals are not, and nor will they, nor should they, turn um, these people away. But um, they're getting care, but are they getting the appropriate level of care? Uh, you know, we'll use an example of a psychiatric patient that comes in, but there's no beds available for the long-term care that they need and they end up in the hospital. So can we begin to um, show some metrics around what that looks like for the hospitals, whether it's costs or whether it's um, uh, average length of stay and how many do you have and really show that, um, you know, perhaps there's an opportunity there uh, throughout the state <clears throat> and maybe even dovetailing that into the all pair model to begin to help hospitals solve some of these um, these issues that they're having and getting people the appropriate level of care that they may not offer at their facility. So um, potentially we could begin to un uncover some of those uh, those hidden costs. Um, <clears throat> also, this seems to come up almost every year. We receive budgets and then, you know, Medicare or Medicaid will release their um, their rate decisions, their reimbursement decisions. And, and how do we want to approach that uh, moving forward? around those public payers. Cause it seems like every year CMS comes out and says, well, we're gonna give 2% this year and it's gonna have X billion dollar impact on the hospital industry. So is this something that we want to figure out how to use in rate decisions or do we just need to accept the fact that with the timing that's probably not gonna become, ever become part of our 
um, our work during budgets. So um, trying to reach a decision on on something like that, just so we either address it or we move on um, type of scenario. Um, <clears throat> and the next bullet point would be strengthening guidance around NPR growth and the application of the guidance around that. And, and if NPR is the route that we want to go, um, continue to build out our, our expectations around that. Um, the next one kind of goes against that with um, some of what we've talked about around inflation components of a rate, the matters of cost at these hospitals. Do we want to continue to use NPR or do we want to begin discussions on moving away and maybe looking at expense growth and trying to build in inflationary factors around that? Um, because obviously these hospitals want to um, cover their costs in total and they also want to make a margin. So maybe we can arrive at some new measure um, in the in the time period before we get to um, the payment reform goals that we have in, in the state and moving away from uh, fee for service. So something to put on the table there. Um, if if expense growth is 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 the driving factor, then maybe that's what we want to to measure and build in inflationary factors to see what that growth looks like. And then hospitals will need to get the appropriate level of NPR to cover that. And maybe we can have <clears throat> benchmarks around margins that uh, they have to manage to. Um, that's probably a bigger item for long term, maybe not next year. Um, but we began to see some of that kind of trickle up this year during our discussions. Um, another one would be a matter of procedure. And that is um, starting the deliberations with the UVM Health Network hospitals, um, specifically the medical center. Um, it, it, because of economies of scale, it bends the metrics as we all know. Um, it's also probably the most, and this is not to, to be derogatory towards any other hospitals, but it's probably the most important decision that you make. And if we address it up front, you're, you're mentally more fresh to tackle a bigger, more complex budget. And um, there's also the fact that it does bend those, those metrics, the NPR growth and et cetera. So do we wanna consider kind of flip-flopping what we do now and taking on the biggest hospital in the state first um, and then move our way uh, down the line um, for the remainder of the hospitals? And the next bullet point kind of dovetails into that as well, which may be pooling hospitals into critical access PPS, academic medical centers. Their reporting requirements are different at certain levels. Their reimbursement models are different. Do we want to begin to kind of cater the process to those designations and, and look at them that way instead of the kind of the more broad brushed approach that we do now? Again, that may be a more long-term big picture, um, <clears throat> but that's just an idea to put it out there for discussion. Another one was uh, understanding the fixed perspective um, payment impact on payer mix and reimbursement ratios. We really don't have a whole lot of clarity around that yet, and that's something that we need to build out. Again, that's just one of those value add items that certainly would need a lot more discussion moving forward as the all payer model um, continues to grow. Um, <clears throat> another one that we heard last year in the budget guidance discussions from a few hospitals where a certain portion of their rate request is going to pass down into bad debt and free care. And do we want to get a better understanding of that? That can probably go into that um, components of a rate request um, piece if we choose to go that route, because inevitably some of that money is going to go to bad debt and free care. So if they're getting a 5% um, rate charge increase, what is that actually after the factors of bad debt and free care? So that's probably something we'd want to have more discussions with the hospitals on. Um, the next one was some of the relative pricing models. I believe we had a hospital this year that pointed that out. Do we want to cut, try to build that out a little bit for the board to inform you better as you work through this? Uh, and finally, and this is not irony, I had this written down when the system crashed, was that uh, we really like the uh, virtual board meetings. Um, it saves a lot of time. Um, it was very effective, very smooth. And um, we think that that could be something in the future that the board adopts as opposed to some of the traveling board meetings. So that concludes our list. Um, you know, we put a lot out there, but uh, some of it is obviously 
um, a little less explicit than others. And some of it is can be short term fixes and some can be long term items that we tackle down the road. But with that, I will turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Patrick. Board members, do you have questions or comments for Patrick? Can you guys hear me? We can now, yes. I'm finding on my internet working now, my but my speakers aren't working. I feel like Jeff. I think he always has to call in, so I have to call in, and I'm on my computer. Um, yeah, is this where we're going to be doing our comments, Kevin? Um, you can actually choose if you want to do them now, or if you want to wait till after you hear from Mike Fisher and um, Jeff Teeman. Um, okay, I can wait then until after. OK. Does any board member have any questions or comments at this point in time? Or does everybody wish to wait to hear from the other two? I'd rather oh. wait. I'll wait. Yeah. OK, so next we'll go to Mike Fisher. Mike. Let me try and unmute myself. Um, well, thank you and um, Yes, thanks for finally uh, good that we are finally getting to this this meeting and um, I do I guess I, I do want to just appreciate the moment we're in and just and recognize it. Um, not only the you know the election uh, that has many of us distracted today, but also the um, uh, other also COVID the, the COVID crisis we're still in and I also um, I really do also want to recognize the tremendous challenge that UVM Health Network is in with their network incident. Um, some of you may know um, Vermont Legal Aid had a similar network incident not terribly long ago, and um, it is uh, incredibly difficult. And um, I uh, appreciate that it is um, leading to a tremendous amount of work and a tremendous amount of lost nights of sleep and so on. So, um, and, and that sort of does lead me to the, um, um, I, th you know, I, I think it's worth saying that, that uh, in these moments, um, we, we really all do need to um, recognize that people are doing the best they can and, um, and uh, take a deep breath and um, give each other, um, give each other a break, really. Um, <clears throat> And I don't say that just because now I want to be extra hard on everyone. <laughs> um, I, I really do mean it. Um, so I, I appreciate the list that um, Patrick just went through. And it it uh, it there is one aspect of what I wanted to say that that is in some way similar. I, I think that over the last couple of years, the board and board staff. Um, well, I do. I, I do want to say that I, I really do appreciate the board staff effort in hospital budget process. There's a tremendous amount of work in aligning uh, data from different hospitals and attempting to put them in such a way that we can compare them. Um, that uh, so real effort's been done. Real improvement has taken place, and it continues to be a challenge from our perspective. Um, Th that um, we ask a question or the board members ask a question and um, and um, we're not sure that the answer is being given from hospital to hospital in a, in a way that's comparable. Um, you know, so um, commercial costs as a percent of Medicare, our hospitals answering this question using the same benchmark. Um, various approaches to ACO reserves uh, is bad. How is bad debt counted uh, against commercial costs or spread ac across all categories? When is hospital data provisional and when is it final? Um, these are just a few examples. And so uh, we appreciate that every hospital uh, thinks of itself as um, not comparable to anyone else, that they are uh, individuals and, and they are, yet if we can't compare the data to each other, 
um, it makes it very hard to to um, to measure how hospitals are doing. Um, I I do have to uh, go to a high level for a minute and um, and you know and ask the tough question. Um, you know, with the hospital budget process, and along with the other uh, tremendous efforts that the board undertakes to um, to regulate this healthcare system, uh, are we having an impact on the cost to Vermonters who need care and coverage? And um, so I know that's a challenging, maybe an existential question, um, um, but uh, but it's an important one. For me, it's a lot of effort on your part and on everyone's part, and um, and I appreciate that the board can and will and should uh, present um, the amounts that you've trimmed budgets and rates over the years, um, and I appreciate how much of a um, of a burden that the process has on on the hospitals and others. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I think from my perspective. Um, we don't experience enough of a downward pressure on the cost of on the cost of Vermonters when they need, need coverage or care. It's a little bit of a higher message than higher level than than I know you were looking for here, but I I felt the need to say it, and I and I I, I fully recognize the uh, the arguments. I fully you know I, I heard um, UVM a, just a few weeks ago say uh, how much the um, the costs were out of their control uh, with pharmacy and personnel. Um, and I also heard uh, Marilyn Bartlett uh, from Nashby speak to you the other day. We, we had a follow-up meeting with her just yesterday. And, you know, even if I take a giant step back from the details of her presentation, um, it, it presents a picture that, uh, that there's more room um, that there's more room for us to be putting downward pressure on the on the costs. Um, and then I I I I won't go down the same track uh, that you, uh, the uh, old uh, executive pay track. Uh, I understand um, how small executive pay is compared to the cost of care, um, but I do think that. Um, it tells us something about these organizations. Um, you know, when I look, I'm not just talking about C-suite employees. I'm talking about even significantly further down the hierarchy. When we compare uh, what people in the healthcare sector are being com being paid compared to people in the human service sector, it's twice or three times as much. And maybe that's a statement that the human service sector needs to be paid better. Um, but I think it tells us a little bit about the culture of these organizations, and um, um, and I think it uh, tells us a little bit, um, at least from my perspective, that there's room to put more downward pressure. Um, I really appreciate appreciate the you know the board and the board staff's efforts to create more transparency and more uh, cooperation, and we think that the hospital budget process adds to that effort. Uh, it improves that, uh, and we think it could more. So lastly, just a few very specific things. Um, um, I, I think it's really important that we keep asking out loud the uh, racial disparities in healthcare uh, and impl how implicit bias is built into our systems and how it impacts people's care here in Vermont. Um, I appreciate that the uh, the board and I'm sorry, the hospitals and other entities. Um, uh, predicted my question, me me raising that, um, and I would ask the um, the board to join in some continued focus in that. Um, I'm fearful that that we see, I'm fearful of a pattern that uh, we maybe start are starting to see that um, hospitals who are below average commercial rates. Uh, we're given increases, but don't see that pressure put on ones that um, have averages that were significantly higher, that have above average rates. And we, do, we don't concern that we don't see downward pressure. Um, I'm absolutely fearful that what was originally contemplated as a one-time 
commercial uh, one-time rate increase this year um, due to this very difficult time we are all in uh, will become part of the base. I know and I heard board members articulate clearly how important it was to not do that and I appreciate it uh, and I also apologize it's hard for me to believe it um, and so um, please prove me wrong on that. Um, Um, so, uh, you've heard me say it plenty of times, um, and uh, and I'll just say it again that um, that um, uh, this is an, there's there's an ex extraordinarily different difficult time for many Vermonters, and um, we don't think they can afford it, and we don't think they are affording it. We think that the impacts of um, commercial rate increases. Um, uh, leads to people not getting care. Um, people call my office and tell me that they're going without coverage. Um, uh, and we see the direct impacts of um, higher premium costs leading to higher deductible plan choices, which lead to health care bills that can't be paid. Um, and I, and I, I continue to believe that consumer affordability presents one of the biggest challenges to the reform effort that um, is underway. So I appreciate the time um, and I appreciate this conversation and I uh, appreciate the work that the board is under with this tremendous task. And uh, and I really do mean when I said up front, um, um, we, we also all do need to recognize how hard everybody's working on these efforts and um, and give each other a little break. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, I'll, I'll give you a follow up question uh, before we go to uh, Jeff. Maybe other board members have a few as well. But you brought up uh, the topic of um, uh, compensation in health care. And um, this isn't a new topic. Um, you know, just a couple of years ago, a number of people, both um, from outside observers and um, I would say from inside the legislature, um, raised um, some the issue similarly, um, and the board has never micromanaged a, a hospital's um, line items of a budget. And basically, at that time, I told legislators who were inquiring that if that's what your intent is, pass a bill and say that. And again, um, this year, we saw at the most recent Joint Fiscal Committee uh, a leader in the legislature um, asking Adam Gresham to make sure that uh, the Green Mountain Care Board um, made sure that the healthcare profession did not um, see um, raises in the year when others in Vermont were not receiving that. And a number of legislature, legislators have contacted me again. And again, I've kind of tossed it back at them. If they truly believe that, put it into a bill. And, you know, I, I'm i not sure that it was ever the intent for the Green Mountain Care Board to micromanage each line item in a budget. But I do share your concern. Um, I think that we are in an arms race and it's an arms race that nobody can win. So what we see is one hospital gives a 21% increase in nurses pay and then another hospital decides that their their uh, pay is out of line with that. And we certainly have heard over and over again the, um, the executive compensation questions. Um, but it would would it be your intent, Mike? Are you advocating for the Green Mountain Care Board to go through each line item in a hospital budget? Um, well, to be completely honest, Mr. Chair, I think that you would experience a tremendous amount of pushback. Um, in fact, I think we saw something of that pushback. I saw something of that pushback from the hospital community in the context of the legislative discussion about your sustainability uh, work. Um, and so I, I don't know. I wasn't exactly saying that I think you should go to that level of um, 
of evaluation of, of the hospital budget line by line, I was saying, hey, we, we, we can see something here. Um, this is an input for us to be able to see so that, um, um, you know, hospitals often say, everybody who comes before you says, uh, hey, we are as efficient as can be. You can't put downward pressure on us. If you put downward pressure on us, we will give less care. And um, and I was merely trying to push back on that concept some to say, um, uh, to say, no, there's no way everybody's as efficient as can be. Uh, there are decisions that every organization makes, and um, and this is not easy. I don't mean to imply it's easy, but just to speak directly to it, I think we have some evidence that there's room to put downward pressure on the costs of, of these big organizations that are very good at, um, that are not evil, that are not trying to harm anybody, but their uh, systems support themselves pretty darn well. Okay, board members, does anyone have a question for Mike? Hearing none, um, we'll go next to Jeff, but I'm hopeful that everybody stays on the line so that uh, in case questions come up in the discussion following everyone that uh, we can have some back and forth if uh, that's what really should happen at that point. So, um, Jeff. Great, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as, as Mike Fisher pointed out, clearly we chose a day with just a few things going on. Um, and and so, so I'll start with that actually, because I think um, clearly a lot of uncertainty um, in our national political landscape at the moment and also here at home um, with what's happening at the University of Vermont Medical Center. So um, I just wanna say a few words about that before I move on. As you know, the hospital and the broader network are managing an attack on their information systems and cybersecurity. Um, they're doing everything they can uh, to address the situation, working with authorities, um, and I think doing a great job providing updates and information to patients and families, um, while also making sure their clinical operations stay up and running. So I'm, I'm proud of that quick and effective response, which um, we should always remember starts with a singular question, which is how do we put patients first? And that was exactly what happened here. Um, you know, at a VAS board meeting about a year and a half ago, we had um, the director of cybersecurity for the American Hospital Association come talk to our group. Um, and he discussed in great detail the constant threat posed by um, domestic and foreign actors who seek to compromise information technology for a lot of different reasons, sometimes to disrupt operations, to obtain data, uh, to steal academic research, um, or to attempt to extract funds or some kind of ransom. Um, John Riggi, that's his name, this cybersecurity expert who was also previously the director of counterintelligence um, and counterterrorism at the FBI, said that it's not a matter of whether hospitals will be attacked, but when they will be. Um, and so right here in Vermont in the crazy year of 2020, we have yet another example of how hospitals have to be prepared at all times for the emergencies and situations that can clearly come their way and affect not just them, but hospitals throughout the state. I do wanna say that this morning we had our weekly hospital CEO leadership meeting and there were immediate offers of support and collaboration to the medical center and the network um, as there always are in these kinds of situations. Um, so with that as our backdrop, um, why we're actually here, I, I really do appreciate the opportunity uh, delayed though it may be for us to offer some observations um, about the hospital budget process and what we might do to improve it. Um, I wanna thank the GMCB, um, particularly board members and staff. Um, that I know it's a lot of hard work that you do and obvious preparation that goes into being ready for these proceedings and our members really appreciate that. I also wanna thank Mike Fisher and his team at the Healthcare Advocate. Um, Mike does important work to be sure that the consumer's voice is heard and I appreciate his contribution to making sure that everyone in Vermont gets the health care they need and deserve. That's a critical role, and we're grateful that he plays it. Um, in that very spirit, I'm deeply concerned about the future of the now 10-year-old Affordable Care Act, um, the threat to which grows literally by the moment, I fear, um, and represents another major area of vulnerability for patients and employees um, as well as healthcare providers that are already managing through a pandemic that itself has actually cut coverage levels. 
Um, so I think as you heard throughout the, the budget presentations from hospitals, they're managing the old challenges and the new ones, um, and not just passively, but really as a key part of carrying out their missions. It's why they're engaged in health reform despite the costs and the risks, um, and despite $209 million never coming. Um, it's why we provide uncompensated and discounted care. Um, it's why we advocate for policies that, that put patients and consumers first. And to Mike Fisher's other point, it's why we're working really hard these days on diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts to make sure that we're prominently in that important space. Um, so I, I think it's important to ground observations in the fact that the regulatory processes of the Green Mountain Care Board are complex and hugely detailed. And it can make it kind of easy to lose sight of what we're trying to do here, um, which is together um, you know, improve the system and make sure that it's as good and affordable as possible. So the few observations I'm gonna make are in the form of a kind of SWOT analysis, a fairly traditional way of looking at a process, um, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So let's start with the strengths. Um, the first, as I've alluded to, is that Vermonters have a robust regulatory system that looks out for them. Um, that's working all the time to keep their health care um, costs reasonable and to make sure that it's of a high quality. Um, similarly, the Green Mountain Care Board and my association, along with all of our hospital leaders, um, share the goals of the triple aim, which now includes a fourth dimension, the health of our workforce, which, as you know, has been strained across the country and certainly here in Vermont over the past several months. A second strength of our process and of the budget evaluations this year um, were is the tr how transparent and public they are. Um, nowhere else in the nation are citizens of a state able to learn so much and really participate so personally and directly in the in the health care that their local hospitals deliver. Nowhere do people get this up close a view of how the system works, where it thrives and where it struggles. So the flip side of that is our first weakness. Um, this year, I think like in other years, the board's deliberations on each hospital's budget um, and including the reconsideration hearing that took place um, can be hard to follow. Um, I, I take incredibly close and careful notes. In fact, I usually have 10 to 15 pages of notes following each of these hearings. Um, and I often cannot discern having listened to the hearing and the proceeding myself, and then reviewing my careful notes, just how the board arrived at a given decision. Now, as I said, I understand very well this work is loaded with arcane details, um, and that's part of what has to be gone through to make these decisions. But a public process like this should be understandable to the public. And, and I would say this one is just simply not. Um, if the experts like my team and others who routinely follow this have trouble understanding the deliberations and how they landed in a certain place, I think average citizens don't stand much of a chance. The next weakness I would mention is around administrative burden. Um, in the four years that I've been here at Vaz and part of this process, I've, I've only seen that burden grow. I think we make changes around the edges with guidance and other procedural um, changes. Um, but hospitals are required to provide more information and answer more questions. I do want to comment on Patrick's observation because it's true. This year there was an exception to that um, in the sense that fewer questions were asked and there was, wasn't as much follow-up and that was greatly appreciated given what hospitals were going through. I think maybe the reason it's on my mind so much is that because it is particularly evident to me in the sustainability planning process, which I know we're not here to talk about today, um, but that represents significant new reporting and analysis and work with no new resources to match and nothing taken away from the broader process to sort of ensure that hospitals are not overwhelmed. Um, so now on to opportunities. Um, I think it's an opportunity for the board um, and hospitals play a role in this too, which I'll get to in a second, to better understand and acknowledge expense structures, that they're not easy to change, that they're real, and that these expenses are generally what is needed to run our organizations. The notion that expense cutting can occur kind of ad infinitum is simply not reasonable. There's a floor and going beneath that floor eventually threatens patient care. It, it sometimes seems in these discussions um, 
that 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 hospitals are are not believed about their about their expenses or that somehow they're they're not doing everything to manage them and then political pressure enters the equation and i think the board then sometimes feels the need to do something even if that something might be more symbolic and more harmful to an individual hospital than it is to any kind of systemic improvement um, now our hospitals readily i acknowledge have a role to play here too and that's to make sure that they are careful and deliberate in explaining these factors um, so i think both the board and the hospitals have an opportunity here to explain to one another their perspectives on that issue um, i think um, finally we look at um, the threats and the first one is the most obvious to me which is the pandemic um, the vast majority of the nation is red hot with COVID right now. This includes our neighbors in New England and the Northeast. And while still low in absolute terms, we have three people in the ICU today with growing case numbers in pockets around the state. We all know that winter with people going inside is likely to exacerbate this situation and could even lead to some of the measures we saw earlier this year, like suspending surgeries. Hospitals right now, as we talked about on the call this morning, are tightening visitation policies for that very reason. Another threat consists of a dramatic or unplanned change in the direction of health reform. We have to be patient with what we're already doing. Transformation takes time and persistence and cultural change does not happen overnight. Um, the other threat is a combination of broader factors, including Medicare and Medicaid payment policies, growing numbers of uninsured, which is made even worse by the ACA um, being in peril, um, and the constant need for us to make sure we make infrastructure improvements and can afford the growing cost of drugs. Um, I also think that overregulation itself is a threat. I would say that not just to the regulator, but anywhere. This includes burdening hospitals too much, detracting from the work they really need to do every day, and continually pushing down margins. It does seem that sometimes margins are viewed negatively. Um, and really, without a margin, a hospital is at risk of closing. We, we need to remember that margins in Vermont are not returned to shareholders as they are elsewhere, but invested in our facilities and community health and preparedness. So just a couple final thoughts. Um, uh, I, I think we're always working to take steps to reduce cost growth. That's our responsibility. Um, hospitals are involved in the work. Um, and they are also involved, I think, in being part of this careful and thoughtful regulatory process, which is not just to regulate hospitals, but to make sure that we're doing right by the people of Vermont. Um, and, and I hope that we will continue to do that in a way that's collaborative. Um, my closing comment um, is that hospitals simply cannot afford to do any more in the regulatory space. Um, we were at the max before sustainability plans. With COVID, our leaders and clinicians are stressed and tired and burned out. Um, we are on COVID issues every single day, every single week. This week's meeting with CMOs was all about COVID issues. Even when it's not prominently in the news, it is prominently in hospital space. And so with all of that going on, there is literally just not room for additional inquiries that require hospitals to spend more resources and more time, especially if we don't have a clear understanding of the goals achieved by asking those additional questions. Um, so uh, on a positive note, I have seen a lot of exchanges in the past week from my counterparts around the country who are fighting with their governors and fighting with their legislators about mask mandates, about public health initiatives and steps that need to be taken that are common sense here in Vermont, but are being hotly contested around the country. We do not politicize those issues in Vermont. Hospital leaders sit around the same table once a week and try to work through all these things together. And we do so with you and with the governor and with Dr. Levine. And we need to keep in mind that that's a strength and it's one we need to build on even as we work to improve this process. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Board members? Sure. Um, thank you for all the comments from everybody. And um, I'm going to go through a few comments and then also some um, some areas that potentially may be an opportunity as well. Uh, first, just want to say that you know budgets are a puzzle and there are many pieces that need to come together to produce an acceptable budget. And certain things are required to be sustainable, certainly revenue and operating margin. We do have to have operating margin. I agree with that. And there are certain levers that can drive those budgets. 
and and I think that you know that's where some of the regulation comes into play. You know, some of those drivers are utilization, rate increases, and cost savings on efficiencies. Um, so kind of, you know, with, with that in, in context, you know, and, and then looking at the list that Patrick put together, you know, I, I will give a few comments, you know, particularly um, when we talk about um, rate increases. Um, and, you know, it, it is very clear that the commercial rate increases are pricing consumers out of the market at times. And, and it's also clear that, you know, hospitals' reliance on that, those rate increases vary. Um, you know, I think some of the hospitals really did balance both the community need um, and their, their margin, sometimes sacrificing their margin rather than putting in huge, you know, large rate increases. Um, where other hospitals may look at that rate increase as one of their main levers that they can use to drive their operating margin and thus creating a, a significant rate number, commercial rate increase. Um, we have kind of shied away from giving guidance on rate increases in the past, um, not you know, I'm one, one of five board members, and, and uh, this is where some of that process uh, that Jeff pointed out, you know, we all can't talk about this separately. Um, you know, that may be something that we need to, to put, put in next year. Uh, when we only put one variable, the NPR in there, and a hospital doesn't hit their NPR and comes in with a significant rate increase, double digits in instances, and just say, hey, I'm hitting the NPR, I'm hitting what you said I needed to do, and therefore I can get this rate increase. That to me isn't always working together, you know, throughout the system. So, you know, there may need to be a, a ceiling of, of putting putting a rate increase in. Um, we tried this year to, to be flexible and, and put in, um, that temporary rate increase um, because of the concerns of COVID and, and trying to make the hospitals whole. And I guess for the most part, it, it backfired. It didn't really, you know, most hospitals didn't request um, a bifurcated rate and, and maybe it was convoluted, but the intent was, was to help and, and to, um, to make up, you know, gaps that may have occurred in hospitals. And um, I will go out on record, Mike Fisher, to say, you know, I, I do think that those should be temporary or, you know, or we're going to need to factor that in next year um, when we when we look at what rates, what rate approvals would be, because the intent was um, that they would not be permanent. Um, of course, we'll have the benefit of hindsight in a year, right? So we'll either know you know, did some of the hospitals that projected um, very low utilization, is that what happened or not? You know, so, so we'll, we'll also, you know, we'll certainly work together. Um, you know, one of the points that Patrick brought up about, you know, what happens with the other payers, because when I talk about that puzzle, you know, I, I do think hospitals need to have a margin to succeed. I, I, I don't think you can operate with a negative margin and, and be sustainable. Um, but should should the rates come in higher for Medicare or Medicaid, you know, I, I think it, you know, that, that should be something to look back on what the commercial rate is, whether that's a delay and a year later. But but again, um, you know, we're all trying to get a healthy population and, and allow patients to come to the hospitals. And we, we do not know how many people just don't come because they can't afford it. And and that's that's a you know a big factor. Um, and I disagree a little bit with Jeff on, you know, I, I know you can't cut your way to success, but, um, there are always efficiencies that can, can happen and it can never give up and let up on efficiencies. And one thing we did see, you know, COVID has been a terrible thing that has happened, but hospitals were able to react and, and cut cut savings and programs and, and do things and efficiencies, you know, in order to protect their bottom line. And, 
maybe we can learn from some of those. Maybe some of those are things that could carry, you know, for the future. But, um, you know, cost savings and efficiencies don't go away. When we hear from these, the outside consultants, we hear elsewhere, you know, people are, are doing things for, for less. So, so how, do, how do we do that? Just looking at, a, you know, a couple other things on, on this list that um, aren't on there that, that maybe are things we should think about. You know, hospitals have brought up in the past, should we look at PM, PM? You know, is that a metric we should look at? So when we're talking about NPR or expenses, you know, should we, should we be looking at that PM, PM? Because if more people are coming to a hospital, um, that is going to drive, you know, more revenue. And if we have revenue caps, um, that, that would be an influence. So, so that's, that's something that, um, you know, potentially we, we should be looking at. Um, you know, a couple of things I think, um, you know, in this process that we, we did well as a group is I think we managed well with less information and we should look maybe to understand what we're going to need in the future. Obviously, we, we skinnied down the, the requirements that we needed from the, from the hospitals. And, you know, I, I think that's also on the board to really look at, you know, what do we need to know in order to make our decisions versus, you know, what would we what what's maybe is nice to know or isn't really influencing the decision. So so I do think it's you know it's for all of us to work on, you know, looking at the old requests we used to have to where we came out now and you know potentially reducing some of that. Um, you know I also think we need to have a way to marry a little bit more the utilization and rate um, information to the insurance assumptions. Um, you know, when we work with the commercial insurance pieces, there's a lot, you know, a huge amount of, you know, what, what did we approve from a rate request and um, what went into the QHP is less than what we ended up approving for the hospitals. However, the utilization assumptions that the insurance companies had, I would say, are higher than what the hospitals have. And at the end of the day, it's going to be, you know, the premium is going to be a combination of the utilization as well as rate. So I think we need to make sure in the process we're not just saying, you know, when insurance companies say, if you gave hospital X 10% and and we only allowed them 8% in, the, in their in, um, rate increase for the insurance company, the other piece of that is utilization. So again, if that all catches up you know, on the insurance piece, is, is what what gets paid out and premiums come in. So we will catch up on that. Um, price transparency, you know, we we need to do a better job here. We talk about you know this being a transparent, open process, and it is. I don't see that we have price transparencies though from the hospitals. And, you know, so we, we need transparency on both sides of the equation here. And we don't know, uh, we don't, I don't know, I don't have a good understanding in all cases of what the prices are in each of the hospitals, um, you know, across all the payers for what they actually receive for services. So, you know, I think we need to get a better understanding of that um, and how what's paid for services by payer type. I do think we still need a better understanding of contribution to margins by payer type, by services and things like that. That's how businesses are run. Um, hospitals are businesses and we, we need to understand that. And maybe all the hospitals do, but boy, when we ask questions about it, we don't get an answer. And then there are times when, when they'll, we'll hear that there's profitability where they, they can get the the cost per service. Um, so, so I think that's an area where we, uh, yes, maybe it is more administrative burden, but that, that, that's transparency. Um, and I think that's most of my, um, that's, that's about it. Uh, I guess, I guess a couple other things just beyond, um, you know, some of these other metrics, um, you know, again, we, we really look at NPR. I talked about rate, you know, maybe operating margin needs to be a factor in there. Cash flow, days cash on hand, you know, as well as, um, again, the, the cost savings and efficiencies. Um, but look forward to continuing to work through the process. And um, that, that's my comments. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Maureen.
Other board members? So I'll jump in here um, and want to thank you all for, you know, for, for this conversation. Um, I, uh, um, I'm trying to kind of find the, the big thought to um, uh, kind of organize, you know, all the, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, the, 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 the uh, all, all the factors that kind of go, go into this process. And, you know, for me, um, it's, you know, where do we want to be um, in at the end of 2021 going into 2022? And we have a, a, a kind of a well-established North Star that the legislature has agreed to and the governor's agreed to. And, um, you know, for better and worse, uh, it, it is the all-payer model. And so, um, you know, and then in terms of the, you know, the total cost of care of the population, you know, that's kind of an established target. Um, and uh, we get to that target through population health and through uh, converting from a fee-for-service system to a um, fixed prospective payment system. And so, you know, are we in a position to do that um, over the next, you know, two, remaining two years of the all-payer model? And I would say, you know, the infrastructure that we have in place, um, I think, can work. It's not a, you know, a, you know, a well-oiled machine, but a uh, but I, th I think it is something that can get us where we want to go. Um, <clears throat> we have a, a hospital budget process that we just went through, and um, we held uh, the NPR growth rate to 2.7%, which is uh, highly respectable, I think. Um, but uh, within that, if you look at the FPP growth, it's quite slow. And FPP is the, is, is the kind of uh, capitation uh, system that uh, at least the all-payer model hopes will uh, in, encourage uh, hospitals and providers to be more efficient. Um, we have our insurance review process um, and we've been through the QHP process uh, in recent months. And uh, on a combined basis, we held uh, those uh, uh, premium increases to less than three and a half percent, which is uh, consistent with the all-payer model. And now we have the uh, machinery uh, for this. The, uh, the ACO machinery is established and it's up and operating. It's not just a concept anymore. Um, it is the uh, mix master, you know, that is trying to integrate, you know, um, all the variables that need to be integrated to secure um, population health investments um, and the, uh, the benefits of those um, in the con uh, context of the fixed prospect of payment infrastructure. But for me, there's a whole bunch of macro imbalances that, that I think we also need to address. Um, one of them is the Medicaid cost shift. It is just, uh, you know, um, very difficult for me to understand, you know, how, the, how um, the state can say that there will be no increases in um, uh, <clears throat> reimbursement rates for Medicaid folks other than those that are federally mandated, um, and at the same time say, that that is consistent with affordability. Um, and so maybe we need to look to kind of link our um, um, efforts a little bit to the emergency board, which every year meets and kind of creates this framework for, for um, uh, Medicaid benefits on a, on a total basis, a gross basis, as well as per member per month. And uh, so that, that we can influence that process to be complementary and not just in de totally independent um uh you know I, I i learned about you know that uh that directive to uh of no in knowing no reimbursement increase just by reading the state budget no one ever talked to me about it or maybe talked to some people about it but it just kind of popped up um so i think that the cost shift is something that really has to be um uh, addressed um the uh, payer mix issue, um, you know, where we have at one end, you know, a commercial um, uh, <clears throat> um, share for one hospital is at 62%, and for at the other end of the spectrum, it's 34%. And so, you know, I mean, that is to me a, a real issue in terms of the bu budget, you know, the hospital review process is who has access to, to the resources in the system to do the things they want to do. And and who doesn't? Uh, and you know, as as 
you know, Patrick's data shows that, you know, from the 2015 period to the 2019 period, 90% of all the operating margin went, went to one hospital. And I'm not saying that's bad or good, but it just seems an imbalance, you know, when you have negative operations in some places and, you know, fairly healthy op you know, operating, operating margins in others. Um, and this last budget process of the $72 million that uh, we distributed in in increased in NPR FPP, um, 93.6 of it, you know, went to one hospital. Um, and that just seems an imbalance that somehow we have to think about um, and try to correct. Um, I think uh, in this last budget process, it was about 16% of all of the NPR FPP was, was FPP. And so that to me is, as I said, uh, the capitation mechanism to encourage efficiencies and, to, and savings driven by uh, population health investments. In terms of the commercial insurance growth in the last budget process, on an overall basis, um, hospitals were asking for a 4.5% increase, but one hospital was uh, asking for an 8.2% increase. Um, and kind of looking at this is this is a, you know I think one of the most difficult areas is that Dr. Brumstead, when he presented to the board both during the budget process and during the appeal, uh, was saying basically that. Um, that the board needs to uh, be driven in its decisions by the expense growth of the network. And so, you know, he handed out this chart that showed that the expense growth of the network from 2016 to 2020 um, on, on the expense side was 5.8%. And I have to step back and say, is that sustainable? Can we really do that? Um, um, and it, uh, and I, I don't think we can. I don't think we can achieve affordability um, with uh, um, uh, the state only not contri not contributing to increases for um, uh, you know for for Medicaid reimbursements and and si and the largest provider in the state, which you know occupies about 25 percent of the total hospital spend, growing at five or six percent. So within this infrastructure. Um, you know, that we have, we need to kind of like, I think, get a, a general consensus um, uh, um, or maybe a disagreement, I, it could be, but as to how we are going to achieve the goals that the legislature and the state has contractually signed on to um, and not kind of get lost in the weeds of, 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 of the details of the budget process. I mean, maybe Patrick's point about separating out the, the network hospitals is a good idea. Um, but that seems to be an important one to me, given the the impact that um, the medical center has on the overall budget process. So I, you know, I I don't disagree with a three and a half percent growth rate. Um, that is consistent with underlying economic growth, and I've gone back and actually calculated how that number was arrived at, and it's based on gross state product growth. But um, I think sometimes, you know, I, you know that we're all kind of like you know, moving forward at times kind of somewhat in the dark, like uh, having to deal with a uh, uh, just a, a surprise fact that there wasn't going to be any Medi uh, Medicare increases, Medicaid increases in 2020. And um, <clears throat> so I, I, I guess I would look to, um, you know, this process to try to help refine in a simple, clear, large thought kind of um, a profile as to where we are and where we want to be, and uh, is it realistic, for, you know, given our recent track record, that we can get to where we want to go? I do think that um, the affordability issue is is one that just gets hung out there to dry. Um, you know, Diva with their consultant Wakely did do a study that showed that we could address the. Um, uh, premium cliff from 400% of poverty to 500% of poverty for about a cost of $2 million. And to me, uh, you know, that those are the kinds of things that are worthwhile doing um, rather than just kind of uh, wishful thinking about affordability, you know, where there are opportunities. And this one was done by an actuary where there are uh, opportunities to um, make improvements. Um, you know, I'm you know, we you know we, we we should seize those opportunities. I'm very glad that the board agreed this year 
to in the hospital decisions process to raise the cost shift as many of the hospital administrators and, and CFOs did, that the cost shift is really a structural flaw in our system that we need to address. So that's my stream of consciousness. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Robin or Maureen? I mean, Robin or uh, Jess, sorry. <laughs> I'm happy to jump in unless you prefer to go, Jess. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I would uh, agree with both Patrick and Maureen that having um, a clearer sense of both informational inputs and potentially guidance around change in charge and commercial rate and commercial rate increases would be a good next step. Um, I, that obviously requires more conversation in terms of what exactly that means and what that looks like. But I think because my sense is that we do all share an urgent concern around affordability, uh, particularly in the commercial sector, obviously, we have uh, more um, levers, I would say, in the hospital budget process than in rate review to address that concern, since rate review only applies to about 90,000 people, as opposed to the charge and commercial rating requests in the budget pro hospital budget process. So I think developing that so that there's both more clarity around expectations, and to Jeff's point, taking out some of the mystery may be there. I, I don't, I didn't feel like it was particularly mysterious, but I suppose when you're the one communicating that you never do. So I, um, I think we could figure out a way to make um, that process a little clearer, that it's an important consideration for us, assuming other people agree with me with that. But I, I think in the last two to three years, you, if you look back at our processes, we have really taken a much more in-depth look at the commercial charge increase side of things. Um, so I do think that's an area we could explore and should explore. I'm completely open to thinking about how to maintain um, streamlined or reduced information. Um, I'm not interested in getting information that is not usable to me, uh, but I will say that um, I often feel like um, the information we are receiving is not as transparent as it could be. Um, and so that I think then leads to many follow-up questions. Um, I, I would hate to see some of the non-financial reporting be completely lost. Maybe we haven't been doing that in the right way, but I do think the community health needs assessments are an important job that the hospitals do and I think we did make some improvements in terms of reducing the administrative burden on hospitals by having our uh, our staff maintain sort of those in the cycle so that people were only submitting them when they were newly done and um, we were you know managing the information on our side otherwise um, and in terms of quality I think that is a big black hole in this process for us um, and maybe the way that we had been trying to build that in was not the right way although I I, for the most part, it was asking hospitals to react to existing metrics, not produce more, obviously. Um, but maybe there's a better way to do that. I don't know. Um, I also, in terms of, I'm intrigued by Patrick's uh, point around pooling hospitals into um, categories. That's not something... I don't know exactly what you were thinking there, Patrick. That's something that I feel like we kind of do in our discussions. And it's certainly when I'm doing my own personal analysis, I naturally kind of look to those categories when making comparisons, because of course a critical access hospital and an academic medical center shouldn't look the same um, and they don't look the same. So that that is intriguing to me, although I'm not sure exactly what, um, what you were thinking. So we need to think about how to do that. Um, to Maureen's earlier point around transparency, I do think that we've 
tried in the last couple of years to get at least a little bit better sense of relative pricing um, up across hospitals with new the new federal information that's coming out early next year that may produce a lot more information that I do think we should try and figure out how to incorporate because it is helpful. Um, I think that one of the challenges in this process is that we tend to set our metrics purposely on a in a statewide uh, system level um, and then tailor an, an individual decision to an individual hospital circumstance and budget pressures, um, which do vary substantially across hospitals, even within the same categories, quite frankly. Um, and I and that that I think is kind of the push pull in this process is maintaining that system wide perspective, but also ensuring that you are really looking at an individual entity as well and being um, tailored to their specific situation. Um, I just will because Jeff brought up the sustainability planning and obviously I'm not uh, involved in that until it comes back to the board again um, as a whole in our public process, but I'll just say that you know, we've been talking about the concern around sustainability for a long time now. Um, I think our panel around hospital sustainability will was will, will be two years ago in next spring, maybe, and I may be a year off there. I'm not even sure. Um, and certainly, from my perspective, um, to the extent that hospitals are engaging in that, we would like to understand that process as opposed to. Uh, create new requirements, at least that's how I feel, but that information is not transparent to us. And so um, I think on the flip side, I have not particular. and when quite frankly, hospitals are in financial trouble, I don't see a lot of creative thinking happening. Now, maybe that's just not being communicated to me and that's why I don't see it. But um, I, I think that's what at least I was hoping for with the sustainability planning is like us all trying to put our heads together to think about how um we can maintain our hospitals uh, and maintain affordability because that would be the gold standard i think what we're seeing in other states is there might be more affordability but there's also less access as a result um and to mike's point you know i think maryland's tools are uh and nashby's tools are really uh helpful and interesting and we should think about how we can use those to provide more transparent information on the other hand, the approach there in Montana was to require consumers to travel a really, really long distance in order to get care that was uh, of, was considered to be the greatest value, which is not necessarily good or bad. It's just culturally, I think that might be a stretch here. So that would be a huge cultural shift here. Um, and also, I think somewhat inconsistent with what uh, at least the HCA has talked about in the past in terms of ideal travel times and that. So those are my thoughts. Thank you, Robin. Jess? Kevin, do you mind if I um, quickly interrupt? I apologize, but I have to leave at 2.30 um, to get on another call. And I was wondering if I could just make a couple responses and, and Mike Del Treco will stay on to continue representing us after I leave. Okay, go ahead, Jeff. Okay, thank you. Um, just to a couple of the points Maureen made, I think just to clarify, um, I, I was not saying that that hospitals um, cannot find ways to continue to um, find efficiencies and reduce expenses. I just think we need to acknowledge, as I said, that that can't be sort of an ad infinitum exercise that doesn't end um, and will eventually cut into um, bone, which, which then makes a, a difference in what services are available. Um, and then I liked what Maureen said around there's a possibility of managing well with less information. And she said, you know, what do I need to know versus what's necessary? We used to do an exercise in associations called nice but not necessary, things that, that are interesting or provocative but don't necessarily fuel the process. And I think that's a, a valid sort of way to look at this. Um, and then with regard to Tom Pelham, a couple of his comments, I, I just – I think sometimes what we do in Vermont is we tend to take federal or nationwide problems and express them in Vermont terms, which is not wrong, but then think that somehow they're unique to us. And they're not, and we're not capable of single-handedly addressing all of them. 
We, I think we're doing amazing work on all of the areas. And just to name a few, insufficient reimbursement is certainly one that affects all of us across the country, affordability and premium inflation, the difficulty of participating in advanced alternative payment models and the challenges of doing so. Certainly, I think we're miles ahead of what's happening elsewhere in the country. Um, workforce, the cost of drugs, commercial rate increases to manage expense growth, those things are happening everywhere. So I just think it's important to understand those are not Vermont specific. And then the last thing I'll say um, with regard to Robin um, on the sustainability planning, she said one of the objectives or to her, the main objective is, is how can we be sustainable and maintain affordability? Um, I don't at all disagree with that. I just think it names yet another objective for this work, um, which has already been um, at least five or six or seven other points of the work have already been named. So we can't boil the ocean. Whatever we do with sustainability planning, let's let's be clear about what we can reasonably accomplish. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Jess. Well, I'm going to be off the hook with Jeff's comments because he has to go. <laughs> um, so let me start. Well, let me start a little bit with forty thousand feet up. Um, I do think that there, you know, we did a skinny down version this year, and I think that we can learn a lot from that. So how do we manage with less information? Um, if the information that we are receiving is enough for us to make decisions. So I think we should look back on what we actually received this year, what we uh, did not receive, and do we need to really uh, make sure that we have all of that information to the point about the administrative burden. I get that. Uh, and then the other kind of 40,000 foot comment I'll make is that I think there's two approaches here. One is to continue to put numeric measures on guidelines, like we have the 3.5 on NPR. Um, we could, you know, I think there's probably been too much emphasis on that one number. And I think that we may want to either uh, add more guardrails around commercial rate, for example, so that hospitals have more information, more direction in the budget process. Since we do seem to be making decisions around commercial rate, we could potentially put more guardrails around that. And I can talk about that in a second. There would be fewer surprises here, but um, there'd also be a little less latitude, right, in constructing that budget. The other approach could be to uh, basically, you know, think about to, this is to some degree what Tom was saying around we have an all payer model, we have payment reform goals, we have quality goals, we have financial targets that we have to meet. We could potentially just say, hey, these are the these are the state's goals under the all payer model. Submit a budget consistent with achieving those goals. And, and give a little bit more latitude for the hospitals to, to submit those budgets, but the recognition will be then there's gonna be more surprises potentially because there's fewer guardrails. So I think that's a conversation that we could have. I think there probably is too much emphasis right now on NPR as the target, and if you meet it, then your budget is approved. I don't think that's what the board intended with that, with that particular guardrail. So I think we need to be clearer on that as we go forward. Um, Others have talked about the commercial rate. I think a couple of things. Um, I think the commercial rate requests have to be, first of all, better understood and more consistent across hospitals. We really need to truly understand what, what is the effective commercial rate ask here, not what is change in charge. What is the effective commercial rate? How is it going to hit people's pockets? Um, so we need to have an apples to apples comparison. When we have our hospital budget process, we have you know we have two columns, one for the network and one for everybody else. And I think we just need to make sure that the, the, the information we're getting is consistent across all hospitals. And I think to others' points, we absolutely need more information on the base rate. We uh, are operating a little bit. We, we talk mostly about rate increases, but we don't know that rate increase upon what base are we talking about. So we've tried to get at some of this. And in, in part, you know, the healthcare advocate has been helping with asking about commercial to Medicare ratios as one mechanism to understand what is the base rate here. Uh, the sustainability plans have been asking about, uh, you know, we're gathering information from the cost reports on charge markups and private price ratios. These may be mechanisms to understand what the base rate is. The If the federal government uh, does that rule goes through in January, we will get a lot more information about the hospitals. I don't know if that's actually going to go through. I know it's in the courts right now. So I think we need a mechanism. I would just argue strongly, we need to understand the base upon which these rates are being applied. And we need to figure that out through either using the cost reports, using the commercial to Medicare ratios, getting that data somewhere, 
getting it from the insurers, I don't know, but I would, I would really, I think we need to understand that better so we can make better decisions. Um, I would also say that I, I liked Patrick's idea. This was something I've been thinking about, uh, breaking down the commercial rate request into its component parts. We tried to do that a little bit this year. I think we need to understand, first of all, I think we should be asking the hospitals about their medical inflation. We need to ask them, you know, break down for us, what is your wage and compensation growth gonna be? And what percentage of your expenses are wages and compensation, right? For most hospitals, wage and compensation growth is the vast majority of their expense growth, right? This is a service industry. That's, that's where their large expense growth is coming from. So uh, understanding what that is, uh, is it a market adjustment? Is it COLA? What, what's happening in that line item? And then understanding pharmaceuticals. We understand pharmaceuticals are, are an expense that, you know, a price inflation that's beyond the hospital's control. So what are the anticipated pharmaceutical increases and what component of their expense budget is that? From the hospitals this year, that was a smaller component. It was about 10% or less for most hospitals. So while the rate increase or the, the inflationary pressures of pharmaceutical drugs is high, it's still a small component of their expenses overall. And then there's non-medical expenses, you know, medical, uh, and there's also medical supplies and non-medical expenses. So we really need to understand what that is. Some of it is beyond the hospital's control. Um, some of it may be in the hospital's control. We need to understand that. Uh, and then, so that's one component of a commercial rate increase, for example, it might be, hey, we got to cover medical inflation. There could be other components to it, and we need to understand that. One might be, hey, we got to cover medical inflation for the public payers that are not increasing their rates with, you know, um, in conjunction with medical inflation. So effectively, the cost shift. What component of your commercial rate infl uh, commercial rate increase is effectively covering the cost shift? And then finally, what is the component of your commercial rate increase is trying to increase your margin? Those are the three components that I can see. And we don't have a good sense of what how that breaks down. And I think we can do a better job of asking hospitals to break that down for us um, in a way that's consistent and apples to apples across all hospitals. And I think it would help us if we really are going to be thinking about what are reasonable commercial rate increases. Um, so I would also say, and this is to a point I think Maureen made, if we're going to continue to rely at all on NPR, which is price and utilization, we absolutely need to understand patient migration because there are hospitals that are seeing inflows of patients that's gonna drive up utilization. And there are, there are hospitals that are seeing outflows of patients that are gonna see a decline in utilization. So it doesn't make any sense to just have a fixed NPR amount without somehow accounting for patient inflows and outflows. So we need to, we need to do a better job on that. We've talked about it before but somehow you know and we're getting closer because i think you know our data team has been really looking at this a little bit so how can we incorporate that in our analysis next year if we are going to be looking at npr again um i still think it'd be helpful to understand in state and out of state because border hospitals have different uh patient flows and to the degree that we're mostly concerned about cost to vermonters you know, inflows from out of state, I think about as medical tourism, that's helping the bottom line and it's not costing Vermonters. So how do we think about that? We, we've we never really gotten our handles or hands around that, um, but I will add that to the list of information that would be helpful. Um, I think that benchmarking, which we're getting at with the sustainability plans will be helpful as we go through, forward with our hospital budget process. There's a lot of metrics that now we're looking at that we're trying to find appropriate benchmarks for that we can bring into a, in, uh, import into our hospital budget process that I think will be useful. And it will allow us to break down academic medical centers compared to other academic medical centers, you know, PPS hospitals compared to other PPS hospitals and critical access hospitals compared to other critical access hospitals. So I think that is gonna be something that will hopefully be um, a holdover or you know an infusion of information from the sustainability planning that I think we'll, we should bring into the hospital budget process. Uh, the quality work I think is interesting. I think one of the things that's come through with our some of our sustainability meetings is the NISQIP. NISQIP used to be a uh, quality reporting service that hospitals participated in. 
when there was funding for it, and it gave a lot of information about uh, hospital infections and surgical, you know, uh, information around quality, around surgical recoveries and surgical infections and all these sorts of things. Some hospitals participate now, others don't. I wonder whether we might explore further having all hospitals participate in that and allowing that cost to be in the budget, right? So allowing that, is, there is a cost to it, although if all hospitals are in, there is a there could be a statewide discount for that, but I think it's worth exploring to have more information about uh, quality because I do think we can we could benefit from more information on that, and I think it would be helpful. There's also lots of learnings that can happen. My understanding from the hospitals that participate in it is that it actually has impact on the delivery of care. That information is impactful for how hospitals deliver care, um, which ultimately is what we what we want. Um, what else is on my list? Uh, my other, you know, I think it would be helpful to have a reconciliation of what happens. We approve commercial rates in the hospital budget process. How do we then learn about what happened after the fact with the negotiations with the insurance companies? How do we reconcile what happened in the hospital budget process with what was ultimately negotiated? And then therefore, how do we reset the base price? How do we understand what the base price is? Is there really truly negotiations happening? Um, or is what the board is setting as what we believe as a ceiling, is that ultimately what gets negotiated? That would be information that we, I think would be helpful for us to have. And then I just want to say about impact, and this is a little bit to your point, Mike, um, about you know how do we figure out the impact of the budget process? And I think the impact of the budget process is always going to be underestimated because we don't know what the hospital budgets would look like in the but for world without a hospital budget process, right? The hospitals are submitting a budget, understanding those hospitals, that those budgets are gonna be scrutinized and be fully transparent. So whatever the impact on, of the board on the ultimate decision of those budgets is gonna be you know, underestimated with what would have been without a board process. And we'll never be able to calculate that. So I just wanna say that out loud because I don't think that's always considered when people talk about, you know, the impact of the board on on hospital budgets. They're submitted knowing there's a board process. So um, I think that those are my those are my comments. But I really also wanted to appreciate everybody's comments and everybody's thoughtfulness. And you know, we're always iterating, we're always trying to improve, and hopefully this will be another iteration. So those are my thoughts. Thank you, Jess. So I'll just chime in um, here a little bit. And let me start by saying that um, I'm proud to be a regulator in Vermont. And I say that without reservation, because I think if you take a look at any indication of um, the quality of health care in states and around the country, Vermont always ranks near the top. And oh. I take very seriously um, our role in ensuring that Vermonters have access to quality care. At the same time, um, I do think that um, we have failed somewhat in our specificity, and it really gets down to the guidance, because I can't blame a hospital who plays by the rules of the game and comes in with a budget that meets everything that is in the guidance. And I think that um, the guidance is where we really need to focus and try to do a better job of getting better information. I don't agree with everyone that believes that this is an entirely transparent process. I feel sometimes like I'm making decisions in the murky underwater because we've all been in the, the situations where a hospital has made the arguments that um, they have received one of the um, lowest average um, increases in rates since the inception of the Green Mountain Care Board in that you then look at their total cost of care and it's way above the state average. And so I think that um, what, what we really need to be doing is taking a step back and looking at the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is that we want every Vermonter to have access to high quality care at the most affordable rate possible. And in order to do that, I think we have to um, really focus more on what that total cost of care is 
and what the quality is in a given area. And at the same time that we're doing that, I think that now more than ever, we have to go back um, to what we were doing a few years ago because during COVID, um, unfortunately, it's a natural reaction to um, preserve yourself and your organization. And I think that even though um, from the beginning of my time on this board, hospitals and politicians and everyone has agreed with the premise of moving away for fee from service or volume to value-based care. But I do think that um, when you're forced with a situation like everybody is forced across the country right now um, with dealing with a pandemic, or if you take um, Springfield as an example, when you're forced with a situation where your doors may close, um, I sometimes think that the quality side gets forgotten. And I think that there's been a big push towards um, just trying to get back to volume and not value. And I think that um, that may have been necessary in a number of situations. And I understand that, I accept it. Um, but I think that as we move forward, if we're truly gonna be successful with reforming healthcare in Vermont, we have to get back to the premise of what the underlying goals of the reform strategy that the state of Vermont has chosen, which is to move towards value. And so in the past, we had um, specific pieces of um, our guidance that gave a hospital a little bit more if they were doing certain things to push healthcare reform in their hospital service area. And I think we should get back to that. I think that um, we, we need to create carrots for people to do the right thing. And um, we shouldn't expect them to be able to do that at no cost. At, so for me, it's all about specificity in the guidance. I think we need to be specific, not only about the revenue side, but I think the um, change in charges should be very, very specific. I think that um, we should be probably, and I, and I don't want to micromanage a hospital, but I, I think we ought to consider at least, um, for example, what um, the healthcare advocate suggested today, that wages in healthcare were growing faster than other sectors of the Vermont economy. We might want to consider tying budget orders um, to specific um, criteria such as um, a percentile of peers in the healthcare world in New England or in some other metric that um, might be more appropriate. I get a kick whenever I hear somebody say, well, um, we're well below our peers, but then they're comparing themselves to other markets such as Boston or Albany. Um, Vermont is never going to be Boston or Albany. Um, you know, if you take a look at all the sectors in the Vermont economy, I would think that the vast majority um, are working at pay scales that are below that. And, you know, we've talked about workforce for ever since the first day I came into this position. And yeah, sometimes I feel like our, our message has not been heard because we tried to create a message that we needed to do more to grow our own. We need to do more to create additional supply of quality workforce in the state of Vermont. And yet, what I've seen recently from hospitals, it's the exact opposite side of the economic equation that they're addressing. They're saying we have to pay more um, because we need to compete with our, our colleagues. And the problem with that is it's an arms race that nobody is ever going to win. Because once you raise your rates, somebody else is going to have to raise their rates to be competitive with you. So 
I guess what I'm saying is we need to try to hammer home that message more that we need to increase the supply. And that's the only way that Vermont is going to be successful. I think that we have rare opportunities given these crazy times that we're in to create a message to healthcare workers that Vermont is a place where you can and should be working. And you can make a darn good living in the state of Vermont working in healthcare. And you can go home and plant in your garden, breathe fresh air, and not have to go into an elevator with 25 of your neighbors and worry about if they have something or not. So I think that out of really a, a tragic situation, there are opportunities that we should be seizing upon. And so, um, but getting back more specifically to the hospital budget process, I really do think that we need to um, tie a lot more into guidance about what our expectations are. And it it is not going to be welcomed. I understand that. But I think we need to have the conversation. And, you know, it, it really gets back to um, we need better information. And it may not even be in this process that we'll get that information. Maybe in order to make better decisions in the hospital budget process, we'll actually have to do something that um, the Green Mountain Care Board since its inception has been loath to do, and that's to use our subpoena powers. And I could envision us using those subpoena powers in rate review to try to get to the type of information that would better answer our questions. Deep in my heart, I'd like to believe that um, we are going to have better information in January because of the federal guidelines for transparency, but I also am a skeptic. I'm a skeptic that we're actually going to get the information that we want to get. Hospitals are, are a powerful lobby, and I respect that because hospitals are us. It's our community. It's who takes care of us. It's who keeps us healthy. But at the same token, um, it's very hard to understand why hospitals fight back so much on everybody trying to do what's best for everyone in the future. Because if it's not sustainable, hospitals in the end are going to pay the price and Vermonters are going to pay the price. So those are my ramblings. Does any uh, board member have any follow up or should I open it up to public comment? I just had one thing, um, Kevin, like just in in thinking about some of your comments and Jess's comments around um, the guidance, I, I think that it does make sense to try and figure out if we can be clearer in that in that process about um, what we're looking at. Um, I do think one one area that I forgot to touch on is Patrick. One of Patrick's question is, is should we be trying to factor in public payer rate changes um, in the budget process? And I think that's particularly tough with Medicare. I think it's it if there were rate increases in Medicaid, it would be easier because uh, while this year they were behind because of COVID, normally they try to get those out by July first. So. Uh, while the hospitals may not have it in time to submit, we should be able to get hospital specific information from DIVA. And I do think that's an important consideration um, for us to think about. And I don't think that piece is necessarily that hard. It hasn't been particularly impactful the last couple of years that we've gotten it because it didn't really change the impact of the commercial requests. But so that was uh, one other thought. Thank you, Robin. Any other board member? If not, I'm going to open it up for public comment. Does any member of the public wish to offer feedback on the hospital budget process? Well, a very quiet group today. I think everybody's in a little bit of a uh, post-election funk. I know I didn't get to sleep very early myself last night, and uh, 
just trying to uh, keep up with some of the local races in uh, my county was a difficult thing where, um, you know, it, it's just uh, everybody wants to know immediately. And unfortunately, uh, sometimes you don't know as fast as you want to know what has happened. And um, one thing is clear, we're all Americans. We need to hang in there together. And uh, we will get through this. And yesterday demonstrated that democracy does work. Americans went out in, the, in incredible numbers to um, let their voices be heard and their votes did matter. And so um, if there's not anything else on hospital budget, I wish to thank Jeff, who's no longer with us, but Mike, if you could pass that uh, thank you on to him, Mike Del Treco, and also a huge thank you to Mike Fisher. Um, Mike, uh, I think Jeff really uh, hit it on the head. Um, you are the voice for the Vermont consumer and you are every day protecting Vermonters and uh, we respect what you do greatly. So thank you for your, your work. Yeah, so with uh, that- Kevin, I, I, I wanna thank the board members for a, a really interesting, insightful conversation today. Thank you, Mike. One thing I wanna know is, how did the boiling frog party do in the presidential race yesterday? You see that on the back. <laughs> it was, uh, I, I, you know, it was the list of presidential candidates was amazing, but when I got down to the boiling frog party, I, I, I kind of lost it. So I don't know if it's accurate, Tom, but I did see in one of the national press stories that Kanye got um, 1,200 votes in Vermont. Really? Yeah. Whether or not that's true or not, I don't know but I did, uh, I did read that. Um, is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Say nay. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.